Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Oxford Martin School. Uh, I can't tell you what a pleasure it is to begin to see people more often in three dimensions. Um, we're here for a, a panel discussion about what does the future hold for cities, especially in the light of climate change and migration. And we're doing it uh, in the run-up to World Cities Day, which is this Sunday, is that right, uh, 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 Michael? Um, and it's a, a really interesting time to think about cities. Uh, in 2007, around about, 50% the, um, of the world's population started living in cities for the first time. The first time it had gone above 50%. And by the middle of this century, it's going to be 70%. Um, um, those of you who are sort of my age will have been able to see in our lifetime quite how, uh, how much cities have changed. I first went to Africa as a student. I went to Accra, which I remember as a sort of rather nice, sleepy uh, city. It's still a nice city, but it's certainly not uh, sleepy. Um, we do some work outside Accra. We leave at four o'clock in the morning, so we don't get caught up in uh, a rush hour that makes London look easy. And so we have this huge wave of urbanization. Um, and we have it at a time when cities are facing enormous challenges. They're facing challenges from climate change, they're facing challenges from infrastructure, and of course from health. And we can see that particularly at the moment um, with COVID. And certainly where I've been to in, um, in Accra, uh, you can go to little ponds in the middle of the cities and see the mosquitoes that transmit malaria breeding there. Um, some of the groups that are within the university who are interested in issues around cities and are trying to address some of these problems uh, are, with us to, to, uh, are with us tonight. And um, I'd like to I ask Michael Keith to sort of give us an overview of that, uh, uh, of what's going on. Um, Michael is um, professor at Compass, and Compass stands for the Center on Migration, Policy, and Society. And he also leads the Peak Urban Research Program that uh, we'll be talking a lot about tonight. Um, Michael has had a fascinating history. Not only is he a, a very well-respected academic, but he's practiced what he's preached and has been involved in local politics in London and governance. Um, Michael, over to you. Thanks, Charles, and thanks to the Oxford Martin School for the chance to have this, com this conversation um, tonight. I think there's never been a time more pressing or a time more timely to think about cities and the, the climate crisis one alongside the other. We're here as a, a group of, of scholars who are a microcosm of, of a network that brings together people in China, India, Colombia, South Africa, looking at work across four continents, five countries, researchers in Oxford and across those locations, um, working under a program that uses the acronym P PEAK Urban. The, the acronym P-E-A-K stands for four aspects of, of, of our work that bring together, on the one hand, uh, work from the new urban sciences, thinking about how we use new forms of, of data on a large scale to, to think about the predictability of certain rhythms of the city, but recognizes that that prediction has its limits, that we have to think about the E, which stands for emergence of how new configurations of the systems of cities that are uh, that, that define urban life today come together and shape an ever-changing picture. We know that cities are never finished, but they actually are frequently disrupted. They adopt different practices, so the A, stands for adoption of those different practices. And the K of our acronym, our four letter acronym, stands for knowledge exchange, because never has it been more important to think about the ways in which research is embedded in the world, that it learns from, speaks to, but also engages in conversations with the private sector, the public sector, the third sector organizations on the ground in forms of knowledge exchange, practical ways in which the work addresses the challenges of the 21st century, central to the, the way the Oxford Martin School was established. And as part of that commitment to think about uh, the practical challenges of, of the city, we know that part of that inevitability of, of urban change is change, particularly in the global south, that will entrench and embed people in situations commonly known as informality, 
and our colleagues at uh, Oxford Martin School have helped us develop one particular aspect of our work around informal cities and informality, approaching informality from different perspectives. And we'll hear a little bit more about that, that, that tonight, but it is certainly the case that if the, if the population of cities is gonna grow by 2.5 billion, largely in the global south, we know that significant proportions of those people will be living in situations of residential precarity, in situations of squatting, in situations where the labor markets are informal, as well as the residential conditions, the places where people live are also very vulnerable. And it's in that context of thinking about how we address simultaneously the challenges of the climate crisis and, and the informality that we have to understand that this is a two-way street. This is not a sense of one determining the other, but we know that there will be inter an interplay between the cities of the future and the way the climate crisis plays out. It's in, in that context, I just want to make three simple points before leading into my, my colleagues' work. The, the first is, is precisely um, the fact that, that the numbers speak to um, the interplay between those, where those 2.5 billion people that live in cities actually will, will work, will live, will determine significantly the metabolism of cities, the, the foot, carbon footprint of cities that will be one of the principal dri drivers of climate change for better or for worse over the next, the, next, the next decades. It's a very simple point, but it's also, it needs to be thought about as a two-way street between the urban form and carbon footprint. The second point is the significance of the sort of scale of movement that we're talking about here. Now, there was a term that was uh, sometimes talked about as climate refugees coined or associated in particular with uh, the environmentalist Norman Myers in the, in the 1990s, but also uh, talked about quite openly in the 1990 IPPC uh, report, which predicted waves of climate refugees. And the figuring of this, we'll hear a little bit more from Tim when we sp speak later on, but the figuring of this was very often talked about through slightly Eurocentric eyes, if you like, through ways of thinking about climate refugees, which talked about movement of people from one part of the world internationally. And in reality, the absence of that led to a kind of a talking down of that, that problem in more recent times until certain work, particularly work tied into the Foresight program in the UK, actually, which was respected globally. Scholars like Richard Black and Neil Adger began to think slightly more um, subtly about the fact that whilst that there had been almost a panic about the scale of climate refugees in the late 90s, early 2000s, the scale of movements to the cities in largely in the global south, from the global south, within countries, countries like China and India, where frankly the scale of movement and mobility is equivalent to something continental. When you think about the movement from places like Sichuan to the eastern coast of, of China, for example, or from <coughs> Bihar to, to Mumbai in, in India. The scale is effectively continental. That distinction between what is internal and international migration begins to melt, melt away. And it, it is in that context that we need to begin to understand, thirdly, how we actually make sense of this interface between climate, climate change and, and, and mobilities and migration of people. Because it was over a decade ago that uh, Mike Tyndall, who is uh, sorry, Mike Hume, who is the founder of the Tyndall Centre in East Anglia, which many people in this room will be well aware of, made made the point that sometimes discussion about climate change and the climate crisis is is framed as though the climate is the independent variable and everything else, the social world, is the dependent variable. Whereas in reality, as, as I said at the beginning, this is much more of a two-way street. The metabolism of the, the places that we're talking about is going to have a significant determination on the scale of carbon outcomes, the, 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 the impact of humanity on, on the climate itself. What that means is we need to understand the DNA of those cities, the ways in which the cities work, and in particular, given the scale of informality, the scale of people living in informal settlements and working in conditions of informality, and that is not going away anytime soon. We need to understand how that DNA will generate a carbon footprint of, of its own in, in the decade, decades to come. We can't see the world of cities through a lens that privileges Dulwich. We need to think about the world as a lens that privileges, if you like, Dar es Salaam. 
a different kind of thinking about the, the dynamics of cities, a kind of thinking that doesn't assume we land the technologies of the West in the global South and the outcomes will be the same. We have to understand also that the precarity of my, migrants that move to the cities demands thinking theoretically slightly differently about causality, about the propensity, the affordance of particular cities to generate different forms of, of, of urban life, but also very practically about the ways in which the particular path dependencies and lock-ins people would talk about in some senses, but straightforwardly, the, his, the particular histories and specific geographies of those new for configurations of urban life offer both opportunities and challenges themselves to addressing the, the, the carbon footprints of the cities. That's why our work on informalities is, we think, so important, which is why my colleague Kazem Rahimi is um, leading us on the informal cities element of our work. So. Just before getting to uh, Kazem, when you talk about informality, just to be very clear, so that's a part of the city which doesn't have normal infrastructure and utilities and things. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's those people who are living in residential situations where they may not be sure about whether they are allowed to stay there because they are either mm. squatting or they built their own homes or they are um, in large areas of, of uh, environmentally vulnerable land, which may be affected by sea level change or may be affected by disasters, so that they have a precarity in terms of their, their residential situation yeah. and frequently an invisible to the state in terms of the, the places where they work. Mm. The, the informal sector of the economy is frequently larger than half of the economy in many cities mm. of the world. Um, let me introduce Kazim, uh, uh, Kazim Rahami. Uh, Kazim is Professor of Cardiovascular Medicine and Population Health and is a consultant cardiologist at the Oxford University uh, Hospitals NHS Trust. Uh, having said that, I think I met you, Kazim, three or four times before I realised you're a doctor. This is, this is no, nothing about your medical skill, but we only talked about machine learning yeah. and AI, and I assume you're a highly expert engineer in this. Um, and in addition to uh, Kazim's association with this program, Kazim also leads another Oxford Martin School program on deep medicine. Kazim, can you tell us a little bit about how your multiple interests uh, overlap with Peak? I think the impression that you had from me is the, is, the, is the right one. I mean, I tend to sort of brush over my background as a cardiologist. I, I do do a bit of a practice in the hospital here, uh, but I'm deeply interested in matters that affect population health. Um, and um, I'm deeply interested in finding solutions to that. And from um, my background, I believe that part of that solution comes through um, data and analytics. I mean, Michael summarized it nicely. I mean, the scope of the problem and the scale of it is huge. Um, and in that context, uh, providing nuanced answers to those questions matters. I mean, as he nicely put it, just looking at through a single lens um, of um, Dulwich, as he put it, uh, does not provide the answer to the local decision makers. And uh, in order to be able to provide those um, answers, we need to just adapt um, the, the tools um, that we have in research to the complexity of the problem. And this is really what brings me into, into this uh, from my background. So um, to just continue on um, the uh, points that Michael was mentioning, I mean, our background is um, obviously in health, and this is, this is in the context of, of cities and uh, climate change. If one looks at it, we know that the vast majority of the CO2 emissions are produced in cities. Um, so uh, the problems are there, but the, the, which means the solutions can be found probably there as well or need to be identified. Now, just being more specific about the problems of um, climate change, and I get to the informal cities program at Oxford Martin School a bit later. Um, if one does a survey of decision makers in cities about what they perceive to be the greatest problem of um, climate change, the number one response that comes in is heat-related illness. And I think the reason for that is that is so apparent, that is so palpable. People know that there is an acute problem when the temperature rises, there would be acute admissions to hospital and death. But that also shows the other side of the coin, that we don't see the more salient features of climate change, the more long-term consequences, the indirect consequences of climate change, 
um, that are related to uh, you know, weather change, uh, rainfall patterns, or changing the environment over long term, which would affect you know, pathogens and would, you know, the way they're transmitted, the environment that they progress, and as well as pollution that are, of course, related to that. No one mentions that word when it comes directly in the context of temperature. And that is part of the challenge that we are facing to just measure that. And um, we know that when it comes to um, those hazards for health, uh, the impact of this uh, is, of course, immense. Uh, but one of the biggest problems that we are facing is also that that burden is not shared equitably. Um, throughout the world, whether in high-income countries or low-income countries, what we see is that the less affluent people tend to just um, pay the biggest bill. Um, and that is a big challenge when it comes to heat stress, you know, the, the way the housing is being, um, the, the, the housing that people have access to in different parts of the world means they are less resilient um, to um, high temperatures. There's poorer cooling systems, um, um, as an example, poor access to healthcare and so on, which makes them much more vulnerable um, than the rich. Um, and that brings us to the Oxford Info Informal Cities um, program, where the entire focus is done uh, is on the informal sector of the economy and the informal population. If you like, uh, on average, the, uh, the, the less advantaged strands of the population uh, of whom we know the least. Um, and in part, that is because we have not been able to study those populations uh, data is less uh, abundant in those populations. So therefore, if you like, that is a blind spot um, in, uh, in uh, the policy and the knowledge that we have. Um, and as I said before, we believe that tackling that requires looking at it through different lenses. Um, data is going to be part of it, interdisciplinary research can be part of it, but also going deep uh, locally and having that environmental knowledge is important. Um, so uh, to just give a couple of examples of the work that we have been doing to just flag what I'm to be more specific about what I mean in this context. Um, you know, let's take the example of um, ambient air pollution. Um, most people are aware that ambient air pollution is associated with adverse health outcomes that is likely to increase the, the incidence of respiratory infections um, and mortality in children as a consequence of that. But if one looks at the literature, most of that is really most of it comes from high income countries. Um, and what we have learned is when you go to a local city hall decision maker, they question what is the relevance of that information to us. Um, and if one looks at what data is available from low and middle income countries, there's hardly anything available. So one could just extrapolate to saying that evidence generated in high income countries is also perfectly generalizable to low income countries, but that might not be. So in one of the projects in the Oxford Martin School for Informal Cities, um, colleagues investigated that. Um, through um, remote sex sensing technologies using satellite images, um, the, the, the team essentially managed to just predict um, the local um, ambient air pollution and correlated the geocoded information about health outcomes in this particular case in the entire sub-Saharan Africa, looking at um, respiratory infections in children. Um, and to a surprise, no association was found. Um, and that might have many reasons. Um, that could be because you know th there was some measurement error. That could be that other sources of um, acute illness in children predominate, and we could not depict that signal. It might be that in those poorer environments, simply indoor air pollution is a bigger determinant of health outcomes, and therefore uh, the relatively, by relative comparison, the more modest um, outdoor air pollution does not matter. Or it could be a host of other things that essentially that relationship does not hold true in every place and there might be other factors that interact with it and then that is the challenge for us um, as scientists to be able to provide that information um, at the local level so that people can actually um, understand the, the 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 problems and trying to identify solutions um, another project um, that you know is flags essentially the 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 challenge here is when we talk about um, informal environments, and Charles, you've raised the question, what does that mean? You could go deep and just saying there is no such definition and uh, depends on how you look at it. But of course, as scientists, we want to just do some simplification so that solutions can be found and action can be taken. Um, and uh, in, in one project, uh, you know, remote sensing data was used um, to apply to uh, Mumbai, where essentially labeled data was available where we knew which areas are um, conventionally 
classified to be um, informal settlements. Um, and uh, that data was essentially trained, that data was used to train machine learning models to predict uh, what areas are informal settlements and what areas are not. And that was then applied to Bogota, another city uh, where such labeling was available and the models performed well. I mean, we are not complacent saying we have solved the problem and we know that there are huge challenges there. Um, and that is the work that we are doing with um, Tim and others to just go deeper and trying to provide solutions at the right scale to decision makers. Thanks, uh, uh, Kasim. A, a, a quick question. Do we expect problems from ambient air pollution to be worse in a warmer environment? Is there an interaction between warming and just the particulates and uh, chemicals in the area? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I don't think that the, such interactions have been shown, um, but it, it interacts with a number of things. I mean, you could just say, uh, you know, ambient, ambient air pollution, if it's due to traffic, it could also interact with noise, right, which is, has got also impact on health. I mean, those are, if you like, more uh, refined research questions, but I, I don't think that such a correlation has been shown. Thank you. Um, can I introduce our third speaker, Tim Schwannen? Uh, Tim is director of the Transport Studies Unit here in the University of Oxford. Uh, grew up in the Netherlands and held positions at Utrecht before coming to uh, Oxford. Um, I have a list of Tim's research, but it, it is so all-encompassing. <laughs> It is fascinating how geography has sort of reinvented itself as a sort of subject of everything. I'm very jealous. But the list I have here is the intersection of urban, transport, cultural, political, and economic geography. Tim. Yeah, that's, that's where um, mobility sits. And that's, my, um, that's the main topic I work on. But I'm here to talk uh, first about some of the work that we've been doing um, as part of this OMS project on the informal city when uh, when we started michael and i had the idea to really look into this climate related migration and sort of what that means for cities and uh, we started recruiting and then the pandemic hit and the the two brilliant researchers we had recruited were unable to travel to the cities where we were going to do the work delhi and and addis ababa so uh, we came up with an alternative and we asked them to do a systematic review of the literature on climate related mobility, climate related migration. And uh, Jeno Chung and, and Bawani Basala, the, the researchers who did the real work, um, gathered about more than a thousand documents, um, that is uh, journal articles, monographs, reports, blog posts, theses, you name it. And uh, they sort of brought that down to 173 documents published in the period 2011, 2020, that they studied in depth. And uh, we focused on 2011 because that was the time when the, the foresight report that Michael previously mentioned was, uh, was published. And it sort of really drew attention to the idea that many of these climate-induced mobilities were uh, playing out at the national scale rather than the, the international scale. And uh, what I want to do is sort of highlight four key findings from this systematic review, because uh, I think the first point to say is that over time, we do see within the academic literature a shift towards the city level. More and more studies are looking at the implications of these mobilities for cities. Uh, partially because of these policy documents, the, the, the Foresight Report, but certainly also the Grantswell Report that the World Bank published in 2018. Another key finding from this literature uh, review is uh, the importance of distinguishing between policy definitions and academic definitions, because policy definitions sort of really sort of as Michael was explaining, are to a varying extent uh, uh, informed by concern, if not fear, of large numbers of migrants coming from the south to the, to the global north. And the academic literature sort of says, well, that is really uh, um, quite tricky to think in that way, because it is actually not possible to separate out neatly the effect of climate change from other types of factors that make people move. The causes are 
imbricated, they're complex, and we need to move beyond this uh, clear separation of nature versus versus society, where nature is external and is driving uh, all kinds of processes in, in society. That literature, thirdly, also highlights that we need to think very critically about this whole notion of migration. And uh, because that comes with a particular imaginary of movement, at its most extreme, this is a sort of, this, this mobility is understood as a linear movement from a rural area to a city and as an outcome of a combination of push and pull factors, which is kind of in line with very traditional understandings of, uh, of migration. But if we look at these movements that we're interested in where climate change does play a role, then you see that this is a much more complex and much messier reality where movements more often than not are temporary and circular. Um, they, there's all sorts of periods of delay of uh, staying put. Some members of families moving whilst others uh, staying behind. Movements are seldom from a rural area to a big city like uh, in our case, Addis or, or Delhi. More often than not, they go through all kinds of intermediate stages in intermediate cities and where people end up most of the time depends on their social networks. It's families, people from their village, people they know that can help them uh, make a start in that city. So people have very complicated patterns of movement and mobility. So we prefer to speak about these mobilities as climate mobilities rather than climate induced migration, because I think that that broader concept allows for that messiness, that complexity of the of the type of patterns that we see. And finally, on the role of cities in all of this, the literature kind of seems to move between two extremes, if you like. On the one hand, there is the, the understanding of the city as, um, as a place of opportunity where, and, and upward social mobility, where individuals who take responsibility of their own lives for their own well-being, their own welfare, can, can lead a better life, can flourish, and can also look after the community by sending back money by, through remittances. So in this understanding, the, city, uh, the, the mobility to the city is a form of efficient climate adaptation in rural areas because it helps and benefits these areas in various ways. On the other hand, we see a lot of literature highlighting cities as spaces of prolonged vulnerability, of onward precarity where migrants often end up in precarious employment and in the informal economy, like Michael was, was saying, in self-built developments, makeshift housing, limited access, if any at all, to, to decent uh, basic infrastructures, particularly water and sanitation, and uh, where they often are vulnerable to climate change in other ways, because they, uh, they end up in, in spaces sort of close to rivers or on, on slopes where erosion uh, can be a, um, a, a real issue. And if that's not an issue, then often they face significant discrimination and animosity uh, in, in the, the communities where they, where they end up. Now, this dualistic representation I've just been sketching is in many ways quite tempting, but it is also problematic. Yes, it is clear that the city is increasingly central to the relationships between environmental change and, and mobility, but experiences in the city are in, and in the urban by those who arrive or move through the city are varied. And that's a really important thing is th these experiences are varied and complex. And that is why we need empirical research. We need empirical research using ethnographic methods to complement the kind of work that Kazem has done and that sort of takes forward some of these issues that we've identified in this systematic review.
places that we, we've tried to do that is Delhi. The other is um, in Addis Ababa. I just said a few words about work being carried out in Delhi. My, my colleagues uh, got in Peak Urban and the Informal Cities Program, Bawani Buswala and Mayanka Mukherjee, where we are looking at the ways in which the city tries to think about the classic tropes of mitigating the impacts of, of climate change, but also adapting to climate change. Now, very, very briefly, I mean, throughout history, we know that humanity has tried to tame the city, to control its functions, to shape its form. Corbusier famously kind of flew over the city in a helicopter and tried to impose on the city a kind of rational form. And the 20th century saw many ways in which that failed. So one of the questions we, we're trying to answer is, well, what, what alternative ways of thinking about rationalizing the city apply most applicably to places where not only are the majority of cities growing, i.e. in the global south, but in many of those cities, the majority of that majority are living in these conditions of informality. They're not on the tax records. They're not even visible in terms of clear property rights. They're in places people don't understand. The logics are the logics of invisibility frequently because it's better to be invisible in those conditions because you maybe have opportunities in certain labor markets and the only opportunities for places to live. So in, in the context of Delhi, what, what we have been doing is looking at both the ways in which the city tries to, to rationalize itself, to actually create a new structure in the context of 21st century challenges, where significant proportions of population are living in conditions of informality by both uh, in terms of the water and the control of water, tr trying to actually <coughs> mitigate uh, the, 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 the ways in which, um, uh, sorry, trying to rationalize uh, water supply by adapting the flows of water through the city, but also trying to mitigate the carbon imprint of the city by controlling the, 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 the use of plastics in the city. So what we have done using a standard anthropological technique is actually try and follow both of, the, both of those logics to try and unpack, make visible both the ways in which the informal city works, but also begin to think propositionally about the ways in which it might work differently. That means working with NGOs on the ground to, to follow the way the plastic sector works and to follow the ways in which that attempt to control water is based partly on generating new forms of squatting, new forms of settlement, so that a particular uh, channelization of water through Delhi creates a penumbral region around the city of insecurity where people build new houses, where the people living in those new houses frequently find occupations in the plastic sector, in plastics gallery. And there is a sophisticated literature, a sophisticated set, set of organizations on the ground who try and work with that plastic sector. And Bawani and Mayanka have been working with the, some of those organizations to try and understand the logics of that plastic sector, to think about how it might work differently in terms of generating alternative forms of mitigation, but also thinking about what it means to have settlement logics that are dominated by these occupation of environmentally unsafe lands, to think about how those forms of adaptation that are largely invisible to the state might be worked through differently. So in other words, we think about mitigation and adaptation, but through the lenses of informality, which kind of is why the work we're doing in in Delhi depends upon our work with organizations on the ground, with the folk in, in the informal settlements themselves, which leads me on to the, the, the second of our the, the places we're working, which is in Addis Ababa, which Tim's going to say a few more words about. Yeah, and Addis and, and Ethiopia are very interesting contexts for, for this work. Many people will, will know that Ethiopia has sort of a long history of, of drought, failing harvests, hunger. It has institutionalized food aid in the most climate sensitive areas, which is very interesting because it may actually mean that some of the people who in other contexts, in other situations would have moved to the city have actually stayed put. So this is one of the things that we're, we're very keen on exploring further because we have not yet been able to do on-site ethnographic work uh, in Ethiopia because of the pandemic and because of the, the, the political unrest in the country. So everything I say here is sort of really preliminary is based on expert interviews that, that Jinho so far has done. 
And um, the other reason why Addis is such an interesting case is because it is uh, one of the fastest growing cities in Africa, in a largely rural country that is, that is rapidly urbanizing. And that means that we're previously in situations of, of in, uh, environmental hazards or environmental harm. Uh, people would move from rural areas to other rural areas, for instance, to work in plantations. Uh, they are now increasingly moving to the city because that is seen as a, uh, as a site of more diverse opportunities that also pay better. But um, what we see again here is that the role of climate change in making people move is very difficult to, to disentangle. And um, we see that many of these micro, uh, mobilities may actually be more uh, uh, temporary than in other contexts, because one of the sp uh, specificities of, of Ethiopia is that people cannot own land. The land is owned by the state, which means that people can't sell it. And they have to, they're keen to, to, to keep occupying or do something with the land that, uh, that they have access to. So people send certain members of the family to the city to go and work there, to own and then send back the money. And they make sure that the people who stay behind can sort of look after that land where they, where they, uh, um, where they have sort of low maintenance crops like eucalyptus um, and that can still help them provide an income. And uh, the people, many of the people who uh, end up in the city end up in, in very precarious situations. We're particularly interested in looking at people who end up in construction, the construction sector, because it's a sector where you, uh, you don't necessarily have to have many skills and you can, you, you can get a fairly easy entry. But what has happened uh, as a result of the pandemic and more recently the very large inflation in Ethiopia is that construction has slowed down really significantly in, uh, in Addis Ababa. Uh, much of the work in the central areas of the city where a huge speculative urban development project or series of projects is ongoing has sort of slowed down. And most, most construction is now happening in the suburbs where, people, where the city wants to build many new uh, 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 accommodation for uh, housing for people. Um, and that poses very significant constraints on these migrants because they have to, they have to be on these work sites in the morning as day laborers to get access to work. But because of their income, they cannot really afford to travel by paratransit or public transport. So they end up in makeshift developments at very short distances from those uh, uh, construction sites, which kind of raises all kinds of issues about access to, to, to various forms of, of daily infrastructure. So there's a lot there about that shows us how precarious these people are, and that needs further unpacking, and that's what we're going to do. Thank you very much. So let's come to our last speaker, Professor Susan Parnell. One of the great things about PEAK is not, not only does it have uh, collaborators all around the world, but also in the UK. And Sue is Professor of Human Geography at Bristol University. Uh, Bristol is actually my favorite city. I grew up there. Um, and uh, is a human geographer. I believe you started off on the history of urban development, especially in sub-Saharan Afri Africa and the effects of uh, racial policies. Uh, but in recent years, uh, Sue's work has shifted to contemporary urban policy. Uh, and uh, involves liaising with local and national governments, NGOs, and international donors. Uh, Sue, tell us a little bit, especially about WHO and PEAK. Yeah, thanks, Charles. Um, I mean, I think what I'm going to do is to try and talk about some work to come. And, and to do what I think is significant about what we've heard so far is that what you'll have picked up is there's a relationship between how we think, what we know, and how we act. Okay. And of course, then what gets embedded in cities and is locked in. Um, and when you think about that relationship between climate migration and the city, 
that kind of confluence is one of the, the somewhat newer things that we've begun to think about. In other words, we've begun to think about things relationally. Um, and what I think is interesting about the, the kind of work that, that you see here and the way that we begin to think about that transition implicit in what Kazim was saying, you know, we, we, you, you, you start off by kind of thinking about new forms of data, new forms of analytics, you get new analysis of problems and therefore you make new kinds of interventions. And what's really important when you think about the, these big processes which come together is that there have always been issues which collide. The economy collides with where places are developed. You know? there, there are lots of old intersections, but there are also some new ones. And the WHO work tells for me is really significant because what it's symptomatic of, or what it's, it's archetypal of rather than symptomatic of, is, is a new form of urban intermediary. And what I mean by an urban intermediary, if you think about cities historically, just even 20th century stuff, what happened was media, what happened in a particular place was mediated typically by the town planner or the treasury person, the, the, the city municipal financial officer. If you begin to think about the contem more contemporary period, the, the data people might be really important or the lawyer. You know, so those are city scale intermediaries. National government has the kind of equivalent, but there are a whole lot of new global intermediaries and how they articulate the way things come together both reflects ideas in the academy, the kinds of things that we've been talking about, but it also fixes them. They become the implementers of, and then we study those things and we critique it. And so that science policy circle, if you like, continues. And what's really for me significant about the new range of intermediaries, and WHO is one of them, okay, that is looking at the interface between cities, climate migration, OECD might be another one. Um, the ILO has just changed its definition of how do we measure work, um, what is informal, you know, those sorts of things. What they say and think is really important because it fixes certain things in, in place. And what for me is exciting about what one might think of as this new era of large scale intermediaries shaping urban practice, shaping urban change, is that I think that they are much more open to the idea and to new methods of understanding those intersections. And that's crucial because when you understand those intersections, you prioritize, you are able to synergize, you are able to identify new kinds of gaps. And so for WHO, WHO is not the only, um, the World Bank's also looking at its new urban health um, guidelines. But organizations like WHO are sitting back and saying, we can't just look at air pollution in Ghana, but they do. It's actually one of their pilot cities on their air pollution program. It's fundamental we do that, but we also have to understand the aging process. We also have to understand what's happening in terms of migration. And sometimes, of course, that's embodied in one person who may experience all of those things. But for organizations like that, not to speak out of both sides of their mouths, I think sometimes what we're seeing is they're sitting back and saying, how do we think about these things together? In other words, in an overall framework of thinking about urban health in new ways. And just like if you think about something like the social determinants of health, fundamentally, that report fundamentally changed and challenged the idea that all medical interventions would be biomedical. So too, I think some of the thinking about cities aided by things like AI, and I'd be interested to hear Kazim's view, because he comes out of that epidemiological kind of tradition, actually have the chance to help us think across programs and not just to think programmatically, but also to think more analytically. And when you can think differently about cities, you can begin to act differently. And it's that acting that we all know is what is absolutely fundamental at this moment of profound crisis, both a crisis of, of, of 
mobility, a crisis of climate, and frankly also an urban crisis of a whole lot of cities that are not well enough managed to ensure our health and well-being. And so I find it very exciting that there are opportunities for scholars to engage with these intermediaries. who might be local government, they might be national governments, they may be these multilateral organizations, but actually to complete that link between theory and practice and in that way begin to transform the systems that we have, uh, that we live under. That's uh, really fascinating. Um, time is running on, so I think we might go straight to questions, if that's okay with you. Can I just warn the online audience that if you want to ask questions, then please use the ask question. Um, it is being broadcast, so um, anything you say may be heard by Mark Zuckerberg, so uh, be aware of that. Do we have any questions from the hall? And if you can wait till the microphone gets to you, because people can't hear otherwise. And if you tell us your name before you ask. Uh, sure. Before you... Hi there, my name is uh, Roshan. Um, I'm studying the MPP at Oxford. Um, the question I have to you is this. Um, from, from the discussion that I've, um, that I've been listening to, you know, I've, I've picked up on the importance of, you know, the, of understanding the intersections of things, for example, with it in terms of understanding climate, uh, not as just climate induced displacement, but climate mobility. Um, uh, we, uh, I, what my, my question to, to the panel is, how do we reconcile the importance of an intersectional understanding to climate migration with the fact that these intermediaries that we talk about often have a, a limited um, mandate or it's a defined mandate? How, how should they engage with this work to then act on it? On things. Thank you. A great question. Who would like to take that? Michael. What I would say, just is a very brief answer to a very, very good, complicated question, is that part of the work of the, the scholar is, it seems, is to make visible the trade offs that are inevitable and also the unintended consequences that are almost universal. And what, what that means is, is it most straightforwardly is that whilst those, those, the, the intermediaries, and Sue's very modest about the work she's doing for WHO at the, at the moment in this context, they may not have, have sovereignty or mandate in, in the way that you invoke, but what they introduce is a particular logic. If you make the, you make the city visible through a logic of public health, a World Health Organization logic, we need to understand that that may not be the same as the OECD's logic of economic op optimality. And if we understand the trade-offs between those two, that, then we begin to understand how depending on the actions that may or may not be possible, that, that there will be different unintended consequences. And that may inform a better educated intervention in the city that actually goes back to this root point about how we value different futures in terms of most straightforwardly economic well-being and health alongside each other, not necessarily as irreconcilable, but as actually playing out through those different logics. Thank you. Did you want to add something? So, I mean, I think it's a really important question. Um, and just perhaps to add to what Michael was saying, is that I think it's also important to acknowledge that there are conflicting rationalities politically, but also analytically. Um, and sometimes they overlap and sometimes they don't. And it seems to me it's much easier to deal with trade offs when you understand the politics and when you understand some of the technical questions at stake. And quite often people are unable to navigate that space because they don't have the skills to understand or to be able to represent a particular interest group. And the interest group may be, I'm a data scientist, um, as opposed to I have a particular political ideological position. But I think part of what we're saying is that in the contemporary urban world, you have to be able to do both, or at least some people in this process have to be able to do both. And I think that's the logic of saying, can we have some interdisciplinary dialogue uh, across these things and a set of skills which enable us to register, understand, even if we continue to prioritize our spe specific uh, interests in one or another way. Thank you. Is there another question? Question over there. And again, if you just pause for the microphone to reach you. Hi, um, I'm a master's student in economics, and I have a question regarding food supply. So uh, you said that, especially in the global south, more people will move towards cities, and um, especially with climate change, farming land will become scarce in that, uh, in that region. 
So suppose that most people will live in a city and obviously not everybody can migrate to the States, Europe or uh, Canada. Uh, how can you ensure that a largely uh, large population in a city has enough food and water to actually sustain itself and not just die away in a couple of hundred years? Um, and obviously we in the West have these fancy technologies with vertical farming and have seeds in some bunkers that we can then use and all kinds of technological progress, but uh, especially in the global south, what do policymakers have to take into account to ensure that their population um, can sustain itself? Thank you. I'm happy to have a one. I mean, there, there are a couple of really interesting projects looking specifically at that um, in the African context. Um, Consuming Urban Poverty is a website that you may find useful to look at. And for me, what's really interesting is that they look beyond just the, the question of the production of food. Um, in other words, particularly when you're looking at cities, that question requires attention to the consumption of food and the distribution of food, which Tim knows lots more about and can talk to. Um, and it intersects with big, you know, debates about social protection um, and wages. Um, and so the food question is perhaps one of those examples where you, you begin to say there isn't a single answer or single approach, and actually you do require a set of really quite strategic and differential forms of intervention in order to get to the question that you're, that you're asking. Tim, do you want to answer? I, I might be able to answer myself of, of this thing. So, so uh, I think that there is a discourse that um, cities are bad for soup food security and it takes people away from the rural population. And they can be bad, but if they are well designed, they can stimulate local populations. I think it was Tim who mentioned remittances going back from the city into the rural life. Uh, and this is very much Tim's area, but you get the infrastructure right, you get the investment right, you get the capital out into the countryside to produce the food for the cities, then you can get some real win-wins. What worries me is that when it is actually cheaper to import food, uh, if you're a big city on the, uh, on the ocean, it can be cheaper to import food than to grow it locally. And that leads to all sorts of uh, geopolitical uh, resilience. That's right. I mean, it just so I, the one thing I think the question is really important, but the one point I take also take slight issue with is more cities doesn't mean, mean less agricultural land. I mean, it's not a straightforward equation. Yeah. Well, it depends on the productivity of the agricultural land, right? I mean, in, in terms of the. <laughs> There may be more people. There may be more people than in previous periods moving to the city, but that doesn't mean that there is no population growth in rural areas, either. Because often you see this is a, a population pressure is still still increasing in, in, in these region, in, in these areas. And I think Sue makes some very important points about consumption and about what kinds of food we're talking about. Because if we're all going down the route of sort of a, let's call it a Western diet then we are in for a very tough future. But of course, there are other ways in which we can think about this, especially if we take into account the whole issue of, um, of distribution as well. Um, and that's a, sort of, that's a really important set of issues which immediately brings us outside of the scope of agriculture and brings us into the area of political economy, of, of politics, mm -hmm. planning, uh, transport, logistics, all kinds of issues that need to be considered. Right, I'm going to refrain myself from talking more about food and cities. Clara, you have a question from the our virtual audience. Uh, yes, so Patrick Lamson Hall says, do you believe that cities can control the amount of population growth that they experience? With that in mind, what is the single most important thing cities can do to accommodate new rural urban migrants? Michael, would you like to take that? I think you, what you can say is that cities have tried to limit populations and China may be the most kind of obvious example of the, of the, the more extreme form of this, but the, the reality is they, they, rarely, they rarely can in, in the late 20th or early 21st century. And, and I suppose that the one thing that we are trying to suggest in the peak urban program is, is that it's important not to think about 
a simple recipe, a single thing they do, but to actually raise the questions that are relevant to their ability to understand their configuration at present and make a difference around or make a distinction between those things they can control and that they can't. The answer to that question will be different for different cities across the world. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question and there. Nadia, I'm doing a DPhil in engin uh, systems engineering here at Oxford. And I'm uh, my research topic is the urban circular bioeconomy. So this comes back a little bit to what um, what he was talking about, because right now I'm doing a research internship at Goodfoot Oxfordshire to understand um, what what farmers here in Oxfordshire are doing, um, like where, where their food goes to and how localized food systems should be. And um, it's interesting that also the, the people who work for Good Food Oxfordshire question themselves, like, should it be as localized as the gut feeling should that like tends to be? And for me, I'm just interested, like personally, why, how can we create cities that can actually be biodiverse, that can be a, a place that not only resources are degraded, but where resources can also be, like where it can be a source of res resources. Thank you. So my question is, for people like me, I have time in my PhD, right? So I can, I, I, I want to create models that really can help. But I see so many different research topics and also relevant topics in the Martin's Martin School, etc. And I'm wondering what can I actually do that really contributes because I, I do have this vision that I want to contribute to and I want to model the, the systems here. But what do you feel like is missing right now? Thank in you. The research I'm, scale? I'm sorry to hurry you. We're just coming up to the hour. Who would like to take that? I think the first thing that to say is that you are asking questions at the interface and so being clear about which interfaces you're looking at is a good one so you know you, you so you talk about biodiversity in the city you're implying the food system that may not be the only interface a water system a land system and and so perhaps narrowing some of those things down is is always a good way to start but understanding to go back to our earlier point what are the trade-offs who makes them and how do we actually analyze those in different contexts? Because, and what are the what is the fixed variable in that? So I think there are lots of questions that could be asked, but part of what we've been trying to say is that by reframing where we're asking from and asking slightly different and bigger questions, we will come up with new knowledge, new methods, uh, and probably new solutions. And it's people like you gonna do it. Thank you, Sue. Um, forgive me, we're going to have to draw it to a close here. Uh, thank you and the online audience for some really interesting questions. Uh, just before thanking the panel, um, could I um, point out that over the next couple of months, we'll be running a series of seminars around all aspects of levelling up. So please do um, attend them if you can, either vir virtually or in person. Um, you've heard over the last hour, I think, just some tremendous research and tremendous insights into some of the most important questions, some of the hardest questions. They, they involve so many different uh, things. So please, could you join with me to thank Michael, Sue, Kazam, and Tim for a really interesting uh, presentation.